you. It is good to be with you this evening. For those of you who don't know me, as Toby said, my name is Josh. I'm one of the curates here, and I have the great privilege of speaking to you today on that passage that we've just had read to us and on the topic of invitation. I don't know about you, but I am a raving extrovert, and I absolutely love meeting people and having intense conversations and interactions. Small talk is obviously fine. I mean, I'm English, so I can talk about the weather for hours. But I utterly love it when people just dive into deep, meaty conversation. My wife, Hannah, is exactly the same, 100% extrovert, and loves to meet new people and have those intense conversations. Even our dog, Balveni, named after the best whiskey in the world, by the way, even our dog is a raving extrovert. Balveni is so excited to meet new people, sometimes a bit too excited and he wets himself, so maybe he takes that a little bit too far. But as a family, we love meeting new people and we love those meaty, deep conversations. And the passage that we have just had read to us by Toby has honestly got to be one of my all-time favorite interactions between a person and Jesus in the Bible. It's so intense, it's so deep, and it's such a powerful encounter. So we're going to look at that together this evening. Um, So do keep it open in front of you if you've got a Bible with you, and we'll see what it has to say to us about what invitation is and how we invite people in. And the first thing to say about this interaction is that we invite people to meet with Jesus as a response to meeting Jesus. That sounds really obvious, right? But hear me out. In the context of ancient Israel, in which this was written, all of the Jewish like founding fathers, like the kind of heroes of their people from like back since the dawn of them as a people, they'd all met their wives at wells. So when this story starts, the verse before where we started at says, Jesus sat down at a well, All the people reading it of the time would have been like, hmm, interesting. Um, What's more, Jesus has just been described before this as the bridegroom, just before that in in the book. So with that and the well thing, everyone would have been like, oh my word, he's about to meet his wife. Like, get the popcorn, it's kicking off. And then, outrage of outrage, the next verse says, a Samaritan woman came to the well. People would have been shocked, disgusted. If they were reading it, they would have thrown the book away. If the gospel was being read publicly, there would have been an audible gasp. Like, (gasps) like such drama. Oh, it's so good, isn't it? Um, Such drama. The Jews and the Samaritans hated each other. Verse 9 of our reading said, For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Like, that is a ludicrous understatement. They had a long-standing, hundreds of years old hatred of one another. The Jews considered that the Samaritans had intermarried with the people who had taken the Jews into exile and slavery. The Samaritans had then built their own temple to rival the Jewish ones that the Jews considered to be the true temple. The Jews considered the Samaritans to be ethnically impure. The Samaritans had then defiled the Jewish temple by scattering body parts around it. In a retort, one of the Jewish kings had invaded Samaria and sacked and destroyed the Samaritans' temple. Samaritans had then massacred a massive number of Jewish pilgrims who were making the exact same journey that Jesus is making in our passage. All of this hatred eventually culminates in AD 70, when some Jewish rebels burned the entire city of Samaria to the ground, killing everyone they find in it. Their hatred of one another as two people groups runs deep and is huge. And even more so, in the culture of the day, a man would not initiate a conversation with a woman in public. As we see from the disciples' reaction when they come back and find this happening in verse 27. And then even more than this, as if like all of that wasn't enough, Jesus, a Jewish teacher, a rabbi, a holy man, would never be caught talking to a woman of dubious moral standing. We see this about this woman by the fact that she comes out at noon, the hottest part of the day. It would be normal for women in this setting to come and collect water early in the morning or late in the evening, the coolest parts of the day, and definitely never the hottest part of the day. 
It's also really weird that she's on her own. These things together suggest that this woman is dealing with an immense sense of shame and is avoiding contact with the other women in her community because of that. Or that she's been labelled as shameful by the community and the other women have excluded her. Based on the rest of the interaction she has with Jesus, we learn that her marriage situation is pretty complicated. And culturally, that would have been a labeller for her as someone deeply shameful. She would have felt about a thousand miles away from a relationship with God. Maybe you feel like that this evening. These two people would never have spoken to each other. Jesus' contemporaries wouldn't even have looked her in the eye. And yet, Jesus shows that he doesn't care about any of that. He meets her. He speaks to her. He humbles himself by asking her to get him a drink. He shows that none of the divisions of this world, its code, its judgments, its preconceptions, none of them matter. He meets her where she's at, and he offers her what does matter, living water. What does that mean? The living water that Jesus is talking about is the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. He offers her the fulfillment, the joy, the purpose, the belonging, the peace of a relationship with God. And he says that whoever drinks the water that I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Does that mean her life will always be peachy? Not at all. But what Jesus explains later in the Gospel of John is that the Holy Spirit will mediate Jesus' presence to those who love him after he is no longer with them bodily. So it's this relationship with God and the human thirst for that relationship that the Spirit, the living water, satisfies here and now and will continue to do until Jesus and his kingdom come fully when he returns. The night I came to faith in Jesus, I was pretty perplexed. I had just got home from a house party, and I was perplexed because I felt deeply unfulfilled, and I didn't get that. I couldn't work out how the time I'd had that night could have been any better by the standards that I was living under and the life stage I was in. I couldn't work out how the drugs could have been stronger or felt better. I couldn't work out how the women that I'd been involved with could have been more attractive. I couldn't work out how other people's perception of me could have been better in the life stage I was in. I had wholeheartedly gone after everything that the world around me told me would make me happy and I should want as a young man, and I felt so empty. It was at that moment that I encountered Jesus and his spirit. At 4 a.m. on a Saturday morning in 2013, I encountered Jesus, and he cleared my buzzing head in a moment. And I realized then that I had a thirst for, the, for a relationship with the God who made me, that no amount of good times, sex, drugs, money, power, success, popularity, or esteem could ever quench. We've heard from our baptism candidates tonight that they've experienced that thirst and that they found that thirst quenched by meeting Jesus and being filled with his spirit. As I've said, the woman in our story has a dubious personal life. Verse 17 to 18 says, You're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you've had five husbands, and the man you're with now is not your husband. We don't know this woman's story. But we can know that her relationship status, either by her own mistakes or by the cruelty and injustice of the world that she's in, make her an immensely vulnerable and judged person within the society that she was in. And when Jesus brings this up with her, he's not doing it to create a sense of guilt or shame or to embarrass her, but to meet her in her pain, to meet her in her unfulfillment. This is the area of her life which most shows her thirst for a meaning relationship with God a meaningful relationship with God. The area in which she's always sought a more fulfilling relationship or where she's continually been let down by frail human relationships. And Jesus is saying, your thirst for that 
Your thirst for a meaningful relationship with God cannot be quenched by a thousand husbands. But here I am, the God who made you, who loves you, and wants relationship and a restoration of relationship with you. I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Having encountered this man, Jesus, who was unlike anything she had ever known before, having encountered him, her invitation flows out from there. One encounter with Jesus, and everything has changed for her. She ditches her water jar, the very reason she was out there in the first place, and she heads straight back into the village where all the people she was previously avoiding are. And she says, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? Could this be God's saviour? Could this be the one who has come to restore our relationship with God? Could this be everything we've all been searching for? And that's the other thing that I love about this passage and the beautiful invitational heart of the woman that we see in it. The invite is so simple. Come and see, could this be? Come and see Jesus. Could this be everything you've been looking for? I think so often I find myself overcomplicating the ask or waiting for the perfect moment to invite my friend to the perfect event or waiting for the opportune moment to offer to pray for them. Like when your mate's entire family is dangling off a cliff edge in their car to be like, I don't know if you know this, but I'm actually a Christian and I believe that prayer changes things. Or waiting for the Alpha course where you can guarantee that all the people in the group that your friend's going to be in are incredibly cool. All their lives are really relevant to your friend. And we just happen to be serving your friend's perfect favorite meal on the first night that they'd be coming. And you know, these are all things that have crossed my mind. Like somehow it's on me to package Jesus the right way. Or to present him at the opportune moment. Or to convince anyone about him. But that is not what we see here. The invite in this passage is so simple. Come and see, could this be? Jesus can speak for himself. When he walked on the earth, he surrounded himself with a bunch of absolute muppets who were always missing the point, never understood what he was saying, and never got what he was talking about. And they're always getting confused and muddled and saying the wrong thing. He didn't surround himself with a public relations expert, a defense lawyer, someone in advertising, an event planner. Because he doesn't need you to defend him. He doesn't need you to make him more relatable, to curate the perfect meeting or advertise him, but simply to say, come and see, could this be? D.T. Niles, a Sri Lankan pastor and theologian, said that evangelism, that's telling people about Jesus, evangelism is simply one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. We see that in this interaction. The woman says, come and see. And in verse 30, they do. They come and they see Jesus. Then in verse 42, a bit later, they say to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves and we know that this man really is the saviour of the world. They were intrigued by the encounter that she had with Jesus. So they came to see and to find out if Jesus was all they'd been searching for. They went to explore and they wanted to explore. So they invite him to stay with them for a bit longer. And then they encounter Jesus for themselves. And they proclaim that now they've encountered Jesus for themselves. They know that he is all he says he is. And all the woman had to do was say, come and see. Could this be? Who might God be putting on your heart this evening to extend the simplest of invitations to? To come and see and to ask if this could be everything they've been searching for. The final thing I want to say today is that we invite people out of seeing a vision of his coming kingdom. Over the last few weeks, we've been talking about how in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus told his disciples to pray, your kingdom come. And this kingdom can be a weird concept to wrap our heads around because it's a kingdom of the now and the not yet. In our passage, Jesus said, a time is coming and has come. 
How is that possible? That is a weird one to wrap our heads around. A kingdom of the now and the not yet. Through Jesus' life, teaching, death and resurrection, he has ushered in a beautiful kingdom that is present here and now. You can know God. You can be in relationship with him here and now and know that he has overcome evil. What's more, we can see what the Apostle Paul calls the first fruits of that kingdom now. We can see people healed, transformed, set free, brought to new life in Jesus. And yet, I'm sure we can all attest to this world being far from perfect, far from fully transformed. You only have to open a newspaper to see that this world is not all it is meant to be. This kingdom that Jesus won will not be fully realized until he returns like he promised to. Then his perfect reign will be established. Revelation says that then there will be no more crying or mourning or death or pain for the old order of things has passed away. So until that time, we live in this now and not yet. And that can make it really difficult for us to envisage what that kingdom will be like or look like as it breaks through now, or what it will look like or be like when it comes fully. The Bible says that for now, we only see in part like through a dim mirror. And I have a really wise friend who once told me to pray for a vision of what it would look like when the kingdom of God came to the town that we lived in. And to be honest, I found that so difficult to do. I could experience the goodness of God in my own life. I knew his peace and his kindness. I knew what it was like to feel God's presence with me and the freedom and joy and fulfillment that I found in my relationship with him. But the world around me looked so different to that that I found it really hard to envisage what it would look like as his kingdom came around me. Or in my friends' lives, who actually seemed like they were pretty happy, like they were doing all right. I found it hard to envisage what it would be like when God's kingdom came in their lives. Until one day, I was riding home from work at the end of quite a long day. For as long as I can remember, I've been absolutely obsessed with motorbikes. And I was riding home on this day, enjoying the ride. And I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but bikers do this head nod thing when they pass each other. It's not forwards or back, because when you've got a helmet on, you can't really notice that. It's like a side nod. And you do it, like, towards them. And they, on the other side, you know, do it towards you. Um, and it's like this weird side nod. Every, you might have noticed it, you might have not. Um, and the thing I love about this is that for some reason, it transcends all boundaries. It doesn't matter if you're like on some super sporty bike with your like brightly colored racing suit, or you're like some huge burly dude with like a fat off handlebar mustache on a chopper, like, or whether you're some really old school rider whose bike came off the arc, this like super vintage, or whether you're like some young 17 year old on your little 125 of its like 40 mile an hour max speed. All bikers nod to all bikers, other than like scooters and delivery riders, which obviously don't count. (laughs) But other than them, all bikers nod to all bikers. And on my commute home from work, I had around a 25-minute ride, and I usually passed about two other bikers on that journey, you know. The nod was a nice, intimate moment, Um, quite a rarity. Then, this one evening there was a bike event happening in the town that I lived in called the Western Bike Night, which started at like 6, 7-ish, and I left work around like 5.30. And in that 25 minutes, I must have passed at least 500 bikers. It was like... In the end, I was eventually riding along like this, trying to not veer into the lane oncoming. It was carnage. I was like some sort of crazed, nodding dog. And then suddenly I had this realization, not that I was going to need a neck brace in the morning, but that this was what it would look like when the kingdom of God came to the town that I lived in. Just like I couldn't go two meters without nodding to another biker, you wouldn't be able to walk two meters through the town without seeing the work of that kingdom breaking through. 
You wouldn't be able to go two meters around the supermarket without people being huddled in conversation about the things Jesus was doing in their lives, thanking him, praising him. You wouldn't be able to go two meters without seeing those who have no hope being released into new life, the vulnerable protected and set free, the addicted freed from their addictions, the lonely welcomed into family, the broken healed, those who suffer bodily and mentally being comforted, healed and restored. You wouldn't be able to walk two meters without seeing people supporting and championing one another rather than taking advantage of one another. You wouldn't be able to walk two meters without seeing hope, peace, fulfillment and purpose in the face of everyone you met. You wouldn't be able to walk two meters without feeling deeply connected to your fellow human rather than deeply competitive with your fellow human. This is what the kingdom of God would look like as it broke into the lives of those around us, our friends, our families, our workplaces, our cities. And you know what? This is just my pale interpretation. I can never capture in words what the kingdom of God will look like as it breaks through around you. What it will look like as it breaks through in your life and the lives of those you love. Ask God for that vision. Say, Lord, show me what it would look like. Show me what it will look like when your kingdom comes in my office in my street, in my friend's life, in my city. Maybe you've actually never experienced that in your own life and you want to know more. Why not speak to God, see if he's there, and ask him for a vision of what your life might look like with him. Ask God for that vision and see what he shows you. Ask God for that vision of his kingdom breaking into the lives of those around you. And then when you capture hold of that vision, invite them to come and see, could this be everything you've been searching for? Because our invitation to come and see flows from a vision of Jesus and his kingdom coming all around us. Just like the woman in our story. And that's what I'm going to pray now. So if you'd like to echo that invitation for a vision of God's kingdom coming all around us, all around the things of your life, all within us, why not let God know you're open to it? You might want to do that with your posture. You might want to do it in your heart. But I'm going to pray for us now for that vision. And let's open ourselves up to see what God might want to show us. Yes, Lord Jesus, we thank you that you care intimately about the one. That you don't care about human boundaries or judgments. You don't, you don't shame us. You don't reject us. You meet us exactly where we are. I thank you that you humble yourself to meet with us. You meet us where we are. And you offer us living water. You offer us a way to quench the thirst of a meaningful relationship with God. I pray that each one of us now would experience a vision of your kingdom. A vision of you, King Jesus, and your reign as it comes around us in our lives. In our offices, in our workplaces, in our streets, in our friends' lives. I pray you would give us a glimpse of that kingdom coming in that area, that we might latch onto that, be filled by hope by that, and extend that invitation through your spirit to come and see and ask, could this be all we've ever been searching for?